the concept of failure is kind of hot these days, right? And we look at other people and we think, yeah, failure. They, they, they failed along their path and they finally reached success. But when it happens to us, it hurts, right? It's painful. It sucks. It's, it's deflating. It creates self-doubt. It gets that little voice in our head going, see, I told you so. I told you you're not good enough. And, and we don't like that, right? We think it's okay for other people. But we have to internalize and realize like, no, this is actually, this is actually a real thing. And, and whenever you fail, you have to actually be in the moment and catch yourself and going, ah, okay, I'm about to quit or I'm about to lower my goals, settle for less. But no, this is, this is the path. Welcome to the Spartan Up Podcast with Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up Podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. Success through failure. That's what Jim Harshaw Jr. is all about. He explains what that means and how you can put it to use in your own life. Plus a candid discussion between him and Joe DeSena about his four-part framework and what kids really need to be successful. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by FitAid and Honey Stinger. Race dirty, recover clean with FitAid or FitAid Zero Sugar. Visit ForTheFitAid.com now and sign up to win an amazing grand prize package from FitAid and Spartan. Monthly Spartan prize packs and more. FitAid, recover as hard as you race. Honey Stinger, made with organic honey and delicious ingredients. Use the code HSSPARTAN2020 at HoneyStinger.com to save 30% off. Jody Santa here, CEO and founder of Spartan and the Spartan Up podcast. And I got Jim Harshaw here, super coach, resiliency guru. We're going to talk about, I don't know, lots of things, but why failure is good. You seem to be an expert on failure. Is that a, is that a good thing? Yeah. And um, it doesn't feel like it when you say it like that, Joe, but uh, we'll run with it. We'll go with it, I guess. But uh, yeah, absolutely, man. Like, you know, the, the way this whole thing came about was... Uh, honestly, I'll start from the beginning in terms of the, the where the whole success through failure concept came from. I, I was really bad at public speaking, and I failed at public speaking once. And I'm like, man, this is this is bad. I need to brush up on this skill. So I signed up for Toastmasters, started improving my public speaking, and and I'm driving to work one day, and I hear an ad on the radio for the local Charlottesville TEDx event. And I'm like, God, oh, man, that, that would be a really cool thing to be a part of. And they, had, they have all these great speakers from all around the world. It's one of the biggest TEDx events in the world. It's in the top 1% of biggest TED events. And I'm like, oh, man, this would be really cool. And they, they, they say there's one spot for like a local speaker. But you have to have your application in by ten, this, this, today at 5 o'clock. And I'm like, gosh, I, I'm going to put my application in. It's got to be a two-minute video. And so I'm like, what am I going to talk about? I'm like... What am I really like? What do I really feel like? What do I really feel people need to hear in terms of a message? And I'm like, you know what? They need to hear about failure and the value of failure because I'll be honest, they say you teach what you need. And I needed to hear that. And I reflected back on my experience as a wrestler at the University of Virginia. And, you know, it, it was a story of failure. My whole career, my whole wrestling career was a story of never achieving my meaningful goals, meaningful dreams that I had all through high school. Never, you know, my, my goal was to be a Pennsylvania state champion. Uh, never even got on the podium. Uh, luckily, I got recruited to a great school. I was recruited actually to Cornell, your alma mater. Uh, I was recruited to Cornell, Penn, uh, University of Virginia, Brown, some great schools. And I chose Virginia. And, uh, um, you know, my goal there was to be an all American. I was actually to be a national champion. And my freshman year, uh, I qualified for the national championships and I failed. Uh, sophomore year, I qualified for the national championships again. I failed again. Junior year is pretty much a repeat of the prior two years. I, I qualify for the national championships and my season ends with me, you know, bloodied in the locker room after my a loss, you know, having failed to reach my dream again. And and I knew that like this was a powerful story because we we've all been there, right? We've all been in that moment of like, why can't I do this? What's wrong with me? You know, I see other people succeeding, but here I am failing again. And but I had one more shot. I had my senior season and senior season to qualify for the national championships again. And this time I make it to the blood round, which you know what that is at the NCAA championships. And I get to wrestle the fourth ranked guy in the country 
from the number one ranked team in the country, University of Minnesota, and 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 I did it. I won right in front of fifteen thousand people. You've been to the national championships. It's an amazing event, and I did it. I finally achieved this dream and. And I realized that that story of success through failure, it was the failures that got me there. And, and so that's when that's, that was what the TEDx talk was about. Um, and I, the title of the talk was Why I Teach My Children to Fail. Um, and it was about that story of failure as a wrestler um, and, and how that story Im- impacts me and helps me teach my children about the value of failure. So anyway, that's, that's where this whole concept of success through failure started. You know what's amazing about the story, and I, I, you know, I say it to my kids uh, who wrestle and play soccer. My daughters play soccer. My boys wrestle, and they're certainly not uh, NCAA champ level. So even the level you were at, which you complain about, you know, on your way up to having success, um, they're not anywhere close to there. That would be enough. That would be the dream for many. Um, I say to them, you know, you got to fail a lot just by sheer mathematics. You got to fail a lot in order to be successful. No one comes right out of the gate and does it all right. Like no one, uh, Elon Musk, go down the list, right? Jim Bezos, like you make a lot of mistakes. So why not embrace it? Which I think is what you're teaching. Why not embrace it and look at it as, um, opportunities to learn and find out how not to do stuff because, because otherwise, otherwise if you dwell on it, you're actually going backwards. Yeah. I mean, you know, when, when we look at other people, you know, Mary and I were talking were before the, before the interview here, the concept of failure is kind of hot these days. Right. And we look at other people and we think, yeah, failure, they, they, they failed along their path and they finally reached success. But when it happens to us, it hurts, right? It's painful. It sucks. It's, it's deflating. It creates self doubt. It gets that little voice in our head going, "See, I told you so. I told you you're not good enough." And and we don't like that, right? We think it's okay for other people, but we have to internalize and realize, like, no, this is actually this is actually a real thing. And, and whenever you fail, you have to actually be in the moment and catch yourself and going, "Ah, okay, I'm about to quit, or I'm about to lower my goals, settle for less." But no, this is this is the path. I mean, you have your own success through failure stories, Joe, and and you know Jeff Bezos, you know Elon Musk, and all these people. Like we you go on and on, and that's what I do in my my podcast. I get to interview all these amazing people, yourself included, and we talk about not only their their habits for success, but you know, tell us about a time when you failed. And the deeper, the darker, the uglier, the better. And it, and it's amazing the kinds of failures that you hear about when you talk to extremely successful people. I mean, that is the path, but here's the problem. Like, like when you're, when you're an athlete and and you kind of look at my story, right? For example, just that microcosm, I was an athlete, a student athlete at the university of Virginia and sure I failed along the way, but there were certain things in place that allowed me to be resilient. There were certain things in place, a framework that's in place that allowed me to, to keep going. And, and I tell you, I didn't learn that framework until later in my life. And I'll share that in a second, but you kind of, so I, you know, I grew up a blue collar kid, you know, mom was a secretary, dad's a construction worker from Pittsburgh. And, and I didn't really have any hopes or dreams or goals goals for my life. I kind of, I get to the university of Virginia. Luckily I had this amazing career. I have this amazing experience. I get invited to the Olympic training center to train as an Olympic hopeful. And then I get into coaching. I become the youngest division one head coach in the country coach for a little over a decade. And I get out of coaching and, and then I start my first business and that's a success. And I start my second business and like, I'm on this trajectory of success and and then I hit a point where this next business, I raised angel capital and I built a technology company. We built a software and it fails. And I end, uh, uh, you know, broke, dead up to our eyeballs, my struggling marriage. I'm in the worst physical shape of my life. And I'm, just, I'm broken, broken at that point. And, and Joe, I'm laying there like one night after I shut the business down, staring at the ceiling, like wife's laying next to me in bed. I'm thinking like, like what was in place in my life when I was performing at the highest level as an athlete, as an entrepreneur, as a coach, like what are the things that were in place then that are not in place now? Because people tell you all these great life lessons that you learn through sports and through Spartan races, like I need them. If, if they're out there, I, I need them right now. Cause I'm, I'm at the bottom of the pit. And, 
and it hit me. It was, it was like a camera lens coming into focus. Like there was a framework that was in place in my life that allowed me to push through failure, to deal with adversity, to come out the other side successful. And there, there are four things that were in place. And the first thing was this, like when I was competing, I knew what I valued. I probably couldn't have stated those things as core values like I can today, but I knew what I valued. Like I wanted to be tough. I wanted to live a disciplined life. I wanted to be respected. I wanted to go on to success, just like my mentors and heroes and coaches who I grew up around did. And, and so number one, you have to know what you value. Number two, you have to have goals that align with those values, not goals that align with mom and dad's values, not goals that align with society's values or, or what you see on social media or, or, you know, what most people align their goals with these days, like what's parked in their neighbor's driveway, right? Like you have to have goals that align with you deep down with your values. And I had that when I was wrestling. And then the third thing of this four-step framework is I had an environment of excellence. Like when I was competing, I had coaches to kick me in the ass if I needed a kick. I had, you know, teammates. I was accountable to them and, and they were accountable to me. Um, I had, you know, nutritionists and sports psychologists and all these people around me, right? Um, media, I didn't watch much television, but when I did, I was watching the national championships or the world championships or breaking down film of my opponents or myself. Like there was this environment that I created. And that environment, you know, it didn't have Chips Ahoy cookies, right? I mean, I didn't have like, you know, that's the other thing that you had the, in my environment, like healthy food, nutrition, like what's the environment that you occupy in your life? And then the fourth and final thing is this, like, you know, it's nice to have goals and core values and the environment of excellence. But, you know, if you don't have a plan for following through when the stuff hits the fan, then, then you're going to, you're going to, you're going to fail. You're going to stop. You're going to not going to be resilient, not going to keep going. You know, what about when the, the car breaks down or the kids get sick or a global freaking pandemic happens? Then what? Like when I was wrestling, if I lost a match on Saturday night, coach is like, hey, Jim, uh, I'll see you tomorrow morning at the team lift, eight o'clock, be there in the weight room. You know, whether I wanted to be there or not, I had to be there, right? And there's this, this structure, this framework and it's not just like, it's not just for athletes. Like when you, when I started putting this back into my, in, in place in my life in the real world, like everything changed. I mean, I tripled my income, healed my relationship with my wife, got back in shape again, or doing Spartan races. And as a matter of fact, I'm doing a beast here in a couple of weeks, but started doing all these, and, and I got, I got back on top again. And, and I realized that after I started my own podcast and kind of looking back at my life and the lives of like these, you know, friends of mine who grew up to become Olympic gold medalists, like this is like this framework that's in place, whether you're talking to a Navy SEAL or a CEO or a New York Times bestselling author or an astronaut, like there's a framework in place. It's like this universal framework. And, and that's, um, that's what I do. That's what I get to teach now for a living. I love that. I love everything you said, you know, in ancient Sparta, I was with a Cambridge professor who spent his entire life studying Sparta and the Spartans. And he said, um, they realized very early on when they created that society and their methodology that if everybody wasn't like creating the environment you spoke of where everybody was uh, eating healthy, whatever healthy was considered back then, black soup, um, working out hard, you know, doing the things they did as a group, it would fail. We had to all be holding each other accountable, he said. And, um, and I think that's what you're saying now. The reality is, you know, Tiger Woods, take away dad, take away those guardrails, that support structure, and look what happens. So I wonder, I wonder if, you know, the child has to learn to be able to do all that on their own before you actually throw them out into the world to, to start their third business like you did. You know, maybe, maybe you need to strip some of that away because if all they know, as I think about my own children, my, my boys, my girls... If all they know is that, oh, as long as they show up in the weight room on Sunday morning because they're being told to and they have that, like, they don't know how to do that on their own necessarily. They haven't learned that. Does that make sense or sure. no? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, it, it's, it's, it's harder without the framework, right? I mean, can you do it without the framework? Yeah, you can. You know, I mean, there's, there's the David Goggins of the world, right? Um, but you look at, you look at, I mean, shoot, you look at Navy SEALs, right? You look at the, the, the training that they go through, like they, they can do it better because they're around other people who are doing really hard things. Like I'm, you know, this Spartan race I'm going to do in a couple of weeks, guess what? I've been, I've been training my ass off 
I'm going to go even harder because there's going to be people around me, right? That, that environment that's going to be around me is going to push me. Now, if you take all those people away, uh, would I still go do it? Yeah, I would still go do it. Would I go as fast? I'd like to think that I would. But, you know, world records in, in track are never set without, without that competition around you. So, um, so yeah, there, there's, there's something to the framework. But, yeah, then, then again, like, if, it, if it's constantly spoon-fed to you, is, is there, you know, it's kind of like, um, like Jocko Willink's book, The Dichotomy of Leadership. Like, yeah, you got to have this framework, but is there, is there too much? Like, is there, is there, a, uh, is there a point at which it's, it's too supportive, like, like a Tiger Woods? Absolutely. I have friends who I grew up with, wrestlers, who were freaking superstars in high school. And then they get to college and, guess, and then the guardrails are taken off. And guess what? They don't, they didn't, they, they, you know, they failed, right? They, and they didn't have the resilience to get back up because those guardrails weren't in place. But here's the thing that their goals weren't aligned with their value. Their goals were, they were doing what their dad told them to do, right? This was not an intrinsic thing, right? It wasn't intrinsic. It was extrinsic. It was being forced upon them. And then you look at a guy named Kerry Collot in the wrestling world. Um, he, he's a guy, I mean, his dad, Holy crime. If you hear some stories, I don't know if you've had him on the podcast, but I'd, lo- I'd love uh, to see him on the podcast. I, I don't know him. I know I'll, I'll connect you with him. Yeah, I know of him. And, and for those listening or watching that don't know him, this tr- story may be true or not. You, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard dad would use a cattle prod or an elect, you know, yep. to, to really um, get him moving. <laughs> that- yep. I real legitimately would use a cattle prod and, 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 Kerry talks about that in that and he says, I, I could handle that. Right. And then Kerry went on to, to absolute, you know, world greatness after that. Um, but that's, that's not for everybody, right? The, 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 that ability to, to continue to find the drive. I mean, he's the head coach at the Naval Academy now and he, he's continues to be great at what he does. So this is intrinsic. This was aligned with his values. Um, but the framework, the framework, when you have it, it drives you to more, right? I mean, when you're, when you're working out in the gym uh, uh, and you got other people around you, you just, you just find yeah. a, a deeper level in you. Over the years, a lot of folks have wanted us to build obstacle courses. Um, and the, you might hear the, my bird, and I got a Spartan bird, uh, African gray. I named Helen of Troy, female. And um, she, I can't get her to say burpee yet. She says aru. She says all kinds of things. She doesn't. She doesn't say 30 burpees yet, but anyway, just in case you hear that. I, um, I've had people all over the world want, wanting us to build you know, a permanent obstacle course, and I'm like, it won't work. It doesn't work. People come out to the race because of the community. There's 9,000 other people there. There's 10,000 people there. We're holding each other accountable. We're going through the barbed wire. Like, that's why those weekends work, Tough Mudder, Spartan, et cetera. So, um, so I agree with you, and I, I think – you would work out at one level alone, like I did this morning. But then if somebody shows up, you take it up a notch. But I guess what I'm, what I'm saying, I'm sorry to interrupt. What I'm saying with the kids, this is a lesson. This is me looking in the mirror, reflecting on my own children. I should know. I just wrote a friggin' parenting book. But um, they're going to have to not have me push them to do the things I push them to do. You know, not every day, not not for the next two years, but maybe there's periods of time where I'm like, all right, let's see, say to my wife, let's see how they do on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we really, you really should be having my wife on this call right now because she's, uh, she's way smarter than me, but she's a licensed therapist. And, and she told me this once about, um, she's worked with, with children who are underprivileged kids and just grow growing up in just, just terrible situations. And early on in her career, she was talking to her supervisor and she's like, you know, these kids come back every week and there's no change. Like nothing's changing, right? They're still, they're still struggling. They're still making bad decisions, all this. And he said to her something I thought was really important. He said, your job is to plant seeds. Like these seeds may not grow next week. They may not grow next month. They may not grow next year, but they will grow. And, and I, I think of... I think of like when I was wrestling and and then when I started getting into coaching, the words that my coaches used to say to me started coming out of my mouth, right? And I'm saying now I'm teaching the same thing to the next generation that was taught to me, but didn't really sink in until I'm, you know, in my mid twenties, I'm starting to coach. And so 
Yeah, that, I, I love this. I love this conversation because I love thinking about like, how do we teach this to kids? And it's a great, your book is a great book. I'm halfway through it right now. Um, yeah, how do we teach this to kids so that they can do it? And I think you're right. You know, you, you, you put the guardrails on, you show them the path, you show them the way, and then you, and then you take the guardrails off and say, let's see what you got. Yeah, before, before, before they go off to college and potentially crash and burn, right? When you're not there and you can't put the training wheels back on for, for, for a month or two and make, and make some adjustments. Um, thanks for reading the book. At least I know one person is reading the damn book. Yeah, there's book. one. So that's good. I'll give you a review. What, um, what could people do? I know you laid out your four principles, four rules there that you've thought a lot about. What could people do that are just stuck? Maybe they're at the bottom of the rope like you were when you were laying there in bed and your business had failed. Certainly the way I feel today. I got beaten and battered today. I'm having a tough day. But Marion said we were doing a podcast, and I said, I got the king of failure on the phone. I'm talking to this guy. <laughs> so what could they do? One thing. Is it a cold shower? Is it a peanut butter sandwich? Like, what's the one thing that'll just get you going? This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Fit Aid and Honey Stinger. Honey Stinger is made with organic honey and delicious ingredients. Honey Stinger's waffles, energy chews, gels, and bars give you the fuel you need to push harder, go further, do all the things that we do as Spartans. For training and racing, you need convenient nutrition that tastes great and works. Honey Stinger is Spartan's official on-course nutrition. It's made with real honey. Honey Stinger started with a simple plan. Wholesome ingredients, great taste, and, of course, honey. Why does Honey Stinger use honey? Using an ingredient engineered by nature, not in a laboratory, it has its benefits. In fact, the less you mess with Mother Nature, the better. That's why they're committed to the True Source Honey Pledge. And they've got a special code just for our audience. You can save 30% with the code HSSPARTAN2020. That's HSSPARTAN2020 at HoneyStinger.com to save 30% off just for our Spartan Up podcast listeners. Why do you race? For the glory? For the honor? For the fit aid? Each ice cold can of fit aid and fit aid zero sugar has ingredients to help your body recover. Like BCAAs, glucosamine, turmeric, electrolytes, and omega-3s. Fit Aid doesn't have artificial flavors or sweeteners. That's why Spartan loves it. In fact, Fit Aid is at every Spartan race finish line. It's the perfect recovery for your active lifestyle. It's 45 calories, it's non-GMO tested, vegan, paleo-friendly, and certified gluten-free, kosher, and it never contains any artificial colors, flavors, sweeteners, or sodium. And now Fit Aid has a zero sugar option. It's keto-friendly and only five calories. It's sweetened with monk fruit and stevia, natural stuff. Can you imagine drinking a soda when you could have this after a race, after the gym, hiking, or biking? That's why Fit Aid is an official partner of the U.S. Spartan Race Series, right? They're at every finish line. So grab a can at the finish line, but then you're going to want more at home. So head over to drinkfitaid.com and find out about their low-calorie, zero-sugar recovery blends. That's drinkfitaid.com. What could people do that are just stuck? Maybe they're at the bottom of the rope like you were when you were laying there in bed and your business had failed. Certainly the way I feel today, I got beaten and battered today. I'm having a tough day, but Marion said we were doing a podcast, and I said, I got the king of failure on the phone. I'm talking to this guy. <laughs> so what could they do? One thing. Is it a cold shower? Is it a peanut butter sandwich? Like, what's the one thing that'll just get you going? So um, I, I teach my clients to do a hard reset. And a hard reset, like whenever you need a reset, right? We just know. We all get into that rut. We get stuck. And there are some different things that you can do to do to get a reset. And, and it starts with what I consider the core habits, get a good night's sleep, eat the right food, and get a good hard workout in, right? If you do those three things, it's like, okay, you know, you kind of center yourself, you kind of physically take care of yourself, right? And then, you know, you can do the cold shower. But here's the, here's the interesting thing that I found, you know, interviewing hundreds of world-class performers over six plus years of my podcast and and I always ask, what's one habit that you most credit for your success? All right, and I'm talking to you know professional athletes and astronauts and Navy SEALs on, on and on, and and it's it's never the thing you'd expect, right? You think for 
the Olympic gold medalist that it's the training. You think that it's for the New York Times bestselling author that it's the writing. And it's, it's not. Like the secret to success is, is not doing the thing that you think that they're known for doing. And it's always, the answer is always something like this, Joe. It's always something like, um, uh, I, I journal every day, right? Or, um, uh, you know, I work with a coach, I, I, I work with a mentor, right? Or um, uh, I plan my week in advance every, every week. Every Sunday night, I sit down, I review the week prior, and I plan the week ahead. Or, uh, or I do an annual retreat, and I set my goals, and that kind of thing. Uh, I think back to my life, like when I was, again, when I was wrestling, I'm like, okay, what was the most, like, what was the one hat? Like, what was the one thing that I did that was, like, most responsible for my success, like the one thing, and it wasn't it w- wasn't the training, it wasn't in the weight room or watching film or in the wrestling room. It was always the one hour that I spent with my coaches before the season started, planning my season, planning my year, setting my goals, what weight class, what kind of training, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses? Like that meeting was the catalyst, and and so to the answer your question, like what's the one thing people can do? It's not, it's not go do the thing. It's not continue to wake up and to do the same thing tomorrow because that's what you did today. And that's what you did today for no better reason than that's what I did yesterday. The thing to do is hit the pause button. And I've coined the, the, the term productive pause. And this is the definition of a productive pause. A productive pause is a short period of focused reflection around specific questions that leads to clarity of action and peace of mind. I mean, clarity of action, peace of mind. Like, that's really what we're talking about here. Like, you're stuck, you're in a rut. You want, like, I want to know what to do, and I want to have confidence that this is the right thing to do, right? In the military, they call it after action review, right? It's, it's hitting the pause button, asking the hard questions. Like, what am I not, here's a question. What am I not doing right now that I should be doing? Or what has worked before that I'm not doing right now? Right? There are these questions that you can ask. Like, you know, Tim Ferriss has the, uh, 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 the question, I don't know where he got it, but like, uh, like, what's the lead domino? What's the one thing that if I can knock down that domino, everything else is either easier or obsolete? Like, these are, these are productive pause questions that help you break out of your rut and find clarity of action and find peace of mind. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, for me, My productive pause is early in the morning, the wake up, the workout, and the cold shower. That's my productive pause. That's where I get to like erase all the BS from the day, the week, the month before, and get to focus on like new day, back in the game, like you said, back in the weight room. Um, That's it for me because I could easily say with the amount when you do more stuff, when you attempt more things, more businesses, more countries, whatever, like you're bound to like stub your toe, break your arm. <laughs> like shit is happening every friggin' day. Today was tough. Um, and if you dwell on it, it gets stuck. What do you do? Do you, I'm curious, like, do you guys have, you know, do you have strategy sessions? Do you have uh, some kind of annual retreat that you guys do? Like you guys are, you know, you're growing like crazy and you acquired Tough Mudder. And like, do you guys do some kind of productive pause? Do you have strategy sessions, meetings like that where you go, okay, everybody hit the pause button for a second and let's, let's create a plan here. I, I, um, I'm bringing you in. No joke. We're doing it live right here. My answer was going to be, which is true, we're always fighting the fight. We're alive in 45 countries. Um, we're digging our way out of a disaster with COVID. Yeah. We never have a moment. Do a quick offsite. Can't really follow up. Like, we are just stretched. Um, that's my personality. Let's do more with less, right? And, and just when we're really uncomfortable and stressed, I'm going to add more to what we do. Cause that's, that's who I am. And so, um, I challenge you, if you have free time, I think we have a moment between like Christmas and the end of January where we like, there's no races going on somewhere in there connect with me. And I'd love to bring you in. I'd love to get everybody up on the farm, my team up on the farm and, um, and let's just do it. Let's do a productive pause, um, by, yeah. Harshaw, by Harshaw. And, uh, maybe we could even, maybe we could even start doing some work leading into, um, that, that offsite, 
Like, what do we, what yeah. do we want to be prepared? What do we want to bring? And what do we want to come away with? Yeah. Do you want me to answer that question or is that a hypothetical? I, I'm, we're going to do it. If you're in, let's just do it. I'm in. Yeah. That's what I do. So, so um, what would you, for the audience listening, some of them might own businesses. Um, what would you say the team has to bring to the table for that meeting? Um, you have to, th- there are certain questions that you'll need to answer, right? You'll start with it, The whole thing starts with questions. I think that was Tony Robbins, I think said the, the, the quality of questions that you ask will determine the quality of your life. Right. Yeah. And, and it's going to be the same with your, your, your relationships. It's going to be the same with your health. It's going to be the same with your business. And so, uh, I'm actually doing a productive pause next week, uh, with my team in- internally for my business. And we're going to talk about here, here are some of the simple questions. What's working, right? Just let's just start there. Let's start on the positive. Like, what's actually working? Because guess what? There are a lot of things that are working. There's a lot of things working for Spartan right now. There's a lot of things working for my business right now. Like, start with what's working because you don't want to stop doing that, right? Um, you might even want to double down on some of the stuff that is working. Um, what's not working, right? I mean, that's the, these are simple after action review questions. What's not working? Um, what is, here's another one. Uh, what is the one thing that had we been doing it for the past year would have most moved us towards our goals, right? Asking that question, thinking about that question. Um, so, I mean, these are, these are the fundamental three to start with. And then you're going to want to ask questions like, you know, you're going to have unique questions for your business, you know, where are, you know, wh- you know, website visits and advertising and, and different things like that, that you they're going to be specific to each business. But those are the broad things that, that you start with, like what's working, what has worked and, and what's not working. And then what's the one thing had I been doing it most for the past year would have most moved me towards my goals. So that, that's the start. The lead domino. Lead Domino is another one. Um, here's another great one. And you know, I, I interviewed Tim Ferriss on my podcast you know, about a year ago. And, and inter- interestingly, two things. So number one, he said, uh, uh, you know, failure in and of itself does not lead to success. You know, it, he's, there are a lot of people who fail their whole lives. <laughs> you know, it's the learning that comes from failure. And how do you learn? You learn from a productive pause. Like you hit the pause button and go, okay, what went right? What went wrong? What, what would we do differently if we could go back and do it again? Um, but the other thing is, this is a great productive pause question. You don't ask the question, how do we grow by 10%? Like Pierre Dimanda says, like, if you do that, you're, you're in direct competition with everybody else because everybody else is trying to grow by 10% too. You ask the question, how do I grow by 10x? Right? And this is, this is not n- unique to me. I didn't invent this question. But it's like when, when you start asking that question, you attack the problem in a completely different way. Like you're not even, you're not even looking at the problem from the same angle and through the same lens. And you're not going to come up with the same action item list if you say, how do I grow by 10% versus how do I grow by 10x? Two different, two different action plans come out of the, those, those two separate questions. I love it. Um... How can people find you? Jim Harshaw Jr., H A R S H A W, Jim Harshaw Jr. dot com, uh, Success Through Failure podcast. You can find me on uh, all your favorite podcast platforms. And uh, I got one interview with Joe on there so far. We're going to do, do another one here in a couple of weeks and, uh, and, and talk about the book. So, uh, some great interviews on there over the years. So, uh, Jim Harshaw Jr. dot com and then Success Through Failure. And you can find me on any, any social media platform. Look forward to connecting with anybody there. They say, um, at least for me, the universe gives me what I need when I need it. Today was a tough day. I couldn't have had a better person to hang out with uh, here at the end of my day. Likewise, man. It's good to see you and uh, good to connect here. You're the man. Thank you, sir. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for listening to this episode of Spartan Up and taking the time to make yourself better and stronger. Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan, is back every Tuesday with new interviews. If you want more training and resilience, check out Joe's new book, 10 Rules for Resilience, Mental Toughness for Families, at spartan.com slash 10 rules. And find the key takeaways from some of our favorite interviews from the past at spartan.com slash tough Bible. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by FitAid and Honey Stinger. Race dirty, recover clean with FitAid or FitAid Zero Sugar. Visit ForTheFitAid.com now and sign up to win an amazing grand prize package from FitAid and Spartan. Monthly Spartan prize packs and more. FitAid, recover as hard as you race. 
Honey Stinger, made with organic honey and delicious ingredients. Use the code HSSPARTON2020 at HoneyStinger.com to save 30% off.